I'm going to begin by doing something a bit strange, which is read a prepared introduction. So uh, I know we usually like to be more informal here, but the, the problem is that there's a fair amount of uh, context for this work. And since I haven't spoken much about it here before, uh, the mathematical questions that I'm raising might seem unmotivated otherwise. Uh, they might still seem unmotivated after I'm done with this philosophical introduction, but at least that way I get it out of the way after about 10 minutes and can move on to the technical content. So what I want to describe is an approach to logic and type theory, which I've been thinking about for some time. Uh, this project really began several years ago when I uh, started a postdoc with Paul-André Maliès, and we kind of went round and around in circles trying to pin it down what exactly it was. Uh, but for some reason, the mathematics started working out a couple months ago. And while it still hasn't been fully worked out, I feel confident enough uh, in the ideas that I want to present them here since I think that they clarify some of the issues which people have been wrestling with this year. So let me describe some of the questions and problems which uh, motivated this work with Paul André. So uh, I'm actually thankful to André Bauer, uh, who is not here yet, um, <laughs> uh, for giving his talk yesterday, because we actually share many of the same motivations which come from the theory of programming languages. So uh, one of the main points that I want to emphasize is that computation is important. <laughs> OK. So great. I was just thanking you for giving your talk yesterday, because I said that we sh uh, I share many of the same motivations with, with uh, you know, what you were describing. So uh, I, I was doing long <laughs> No problem. So I just wanted to s m uh, say that you made a great point yesterday, which is that computation is important. Um, and it's kind of funny that you have to emphasize this when you know, giving a talk about type theory because type theory is supposed to be a computational framework for doing mathematics. But I mean, there is an irony that th there is some sort of tension between logic and computation. So as Andre put it, uh, programs can launch missiles. And it's not so clear how a logical deduction can do that. Uh, so, uh, so Andre posed this nice question as, an equation in one variable, you know, type theory plus what is equal to proof assistant. <laughs> and since the programming languages of the future uh, are going to be uh, you know, proof assistants anyways, we might as well equivalently formulate this as Type theory plus what is equal to programming language. Now, uh, Andre suggested that the answer is probably not more type theory. Uh, what I want to try to persuade you is that yes, it is more type theory, but in a broader sense of type theory. OK. So what is type theory? And you know, please excuse me for getting philosophical this early in the day. Uh, but I want to remind you that type theory suffers from the irksome fact that there is no commonly accepted definition of its most basic object of study, namely types. Uh, and not just in the sense that there's many different formal systems, but in the sense that there are two very different intuitive conceptions of what a type is. And you know, these are commonly called types a la church and types a la curry for Alonzo Church and Haskell Curry. And the idea is that you know, types a la church function more or less like objects of a category, you know, that is, as an interface. You know, they place restrictions on the way that operations compose, hence limiting the sort of objects one can construct. Whereas types a la Curry work more or less like predicates or, or observations, filtering out some well-behaved subset of, of objects or terms. So in, in logic and category theory circles, there's sort of a bias towards the, the church view of types, since it somehow seems more logical 
uh, whereas in programming languages, uh, there's actually sort of a bias towards the curry view, since it somehow seems more computational. Uh, so it's possible to be dogmatic and say that one or the other of these interpretations is wrong, but I suggest that that would be missing out on something important, which is that really these two views are perfectly compatible and can be unified, and that to some extent that's what dependent type theory is all about. Uh, the key idea which I'm going to be exploring mathematically is the notion of type refinement. Uh, so this idea is really simple. You know, a type, a la curry, is not just a predicate in a vacuum, but really a predicate over a given type a la church. You know, so maybe you happen to be living in a universe where there's only one type a la church, you know, such as the domain of untyped lambda calculus, for example. But, but typically your universe is more diverse. So, for example, you might be living in a universe where there's natural numbers and real numbers and maybe functions from natural numbers to real numbers. And, you know, if you're in this universe, uh, you can consider now as different types a la curry, you can consider the, you know, the even natural numbers or the odd natural numbers or say the non-negative real numbers or the integral real numbers or the monotone functions or the constant functions. Those are all different types a la curry, but you know, the types a la curry with respect to the church type of natural numbers or the church type of real numbers and so on. So, right. So the point is that these different curry types are always considered with respect to the original church types. Uh, now, I'll just you know, say some history. So traces of this idea can be found in Nicholas de Brown's writing on the, on the mathematical vernacular, uh, what he called so-called archetypes. And I actually found out recently via Bob Harper and William Lovis that the Brown system was influenced by earlier discussions with Donald Knuth, believe it or not. Uh, however, the type theoretic background that I'm most directly basing this work off is that of Frank Fenning and his students who call it refinement typing. And so to be rebellious, I'm going to call it type refinement. Now, uh, before getting to the mathematical framework for expressing type refinement, I want to describe one more related idea explaining the connection to substructural logic alluded to in the title of this talk. Uh, the term substructural makes reference to the structural rules of the sequence calculus namely the rules of weakening, contraction, and exchange in Genson's original formulation, uh, which I'll just remind you of. So, weakening says that we can add hypotheses to the context without changing derivability. Contraction says that we can use assumptions more than once, and exchange says that the order of hypotheses does not matter. So uh, substructural logic arises by modifying these rules for manipulating contexts. Uh, the most influential substructural logic is probably linear logic due to Jean-Yves Girard, but one of the earliest examples goes back to uh, Joachim Lambeck's 1958 paper on the mathematics of sentence structure. Uh, if you simply get rid of these three structural rules, your context effectively behaves just as a string of types, right? Because you know, these, these rules aren't valid anymore. And you can imagine trying to build a logical derivation that a particular sentence of English, say, is well formed after analyzing the types of its tokens. So that's what the idea that Lambeck was pursuing. And in the so-called Lambic calculus, the ordinary imp logical implication, you know, as Genson axiomatizes it in the sequence calculus, becomes two uh, different implications, uh, which you can describe with these introduction and elimination rules. So there's a, a left, no, sorry, a, a right implication, which I'll, I'll use uh, this notation, which is actually Polandre's. It's a little bit different than Lambic's, but so you prove a right implication by adding a formula to the right of the context, and you prove a 
left implication by adding a formula to the left of a context, and then the corresponding elimination rules. So if you have a right implication and you can prove A, then you can derive B and so on. OK, so I just want to mention that this approach has indeed been pursued uh, further in linguistics, at least to some extent, uh, where it is sometimes called categorical grammar, and that uh, linguists have devised even more sub substructural logics in order to better account for different phenomena of natural language. So for example, it often makes sense uh, to treat a sentence as a hierarchical tree rather than just as a string. And so linguists consider the non-associative lambda calculus or even the multimodal non-associative lambda calculus. Okay, so another motivation for my work with Paul André was to try to develop a more flexible notion of context in type theory. Uh, this ties back to the ideas that André was talking about yesterday as one can, for example, imagine that rather than simply being a big Cartesian product as in intuition ethic logic or a big telescope as in Martin Luff type theory, a context could be composed out of arbitrary algebraic operations. So now in uh, Gordon Plotkin and John Power's algebraic theory of effects, a type supporting some notion of computation is interpreted as an algebra. Well, logically, an algebra may be represented a la Levier as a certain kind of pre-sheaf over a category of algebraic operations. And I say logically because in a certain sense such a pre-sheaf may be seen as an entailment relation collecting all the proofs of the algebra in the context of operations. So you know, that is the pre-sheaf associated to some algebra A for some algebraic theory may be equi equivalently expressed as the maps in the category of algebras from, you know, from uh, I A, where I is the inclusion of free algebras into algebras, where you know, the free algebras is, you know, in Levier theory, it's equivalent to the opposite of the Levier theory. So, in this sense, you know, the pre-sheaf associated to, uh, to an algebra may be seen very abstractly in, you know, as some sort of entailment relation right, over context. But what are context? Contexts are free algebras or, or algebraic operations. Uh, so you know, of course, this is some sort of general principle that if you have uh, a logical formula, you can get, gather up the collection of proofs of that log logical formula as a pre-sheaf, right? So if we have some deductive system, we can define a pre-sheaf which sends any context gamma to the collection of proofs of A from context gamma, right? Uh, you know, on the other hand, once you start thinking about things this way, you might wonder uh, why not interpret the formula as a covariant pre-sheaf. So rather than considering the ways that you prove the formula, you might consider the ways that you derive consequences from the formula where this is you know, the pre-sheaf now ranging over conclusions delta, and it's the set of proofs that A entails delta. Uh, OK, so these differing interpretations of, of formulas were considered by Michael Dummett, who called them respectively verificationist and pragmatist meaning theories. Uh, a similar distinction arises in the study of linear logic, 
which Girard termed the polarity of a formula, uh, what makes proof theory, and especially the sequent calculus, interesting is that not only do formulas give rise to predicates or pre-sheaves over context in this sense, but they may themselves in turn appear on the left or the right of a context. Uh, so, you know, clearly, or, you know, intuitively, this idea should somehow be tied to the you know, idea of representability of a pre-sheaf. And pinning this down was something that I was blocked on for a long time. So I think that I have a tentative mathematical explanation for this, which I'll hopefully describe by the end of the talk. Okay, so now back to your regularly scheduled programming, and I'll get to the technical stuff and Yes. You said that you wrote three out. Did you mean all three algebras in the exponent? Uh, right, right. Okay, so yeah. and, and O T is the Lebesgue theory of the category? Yes. Which has objects natural numbers and so on. Yes. How are those things sort of objects of total equivalence? Yeah. Um, I mean, so modulo this fact that in the Lavier theory, the objects are just natural numbers and then the category of algebras, it's arbitrary objects. Um, I mean, every, every, so every Lavier theory, every object, there is a inclusion like this, right? So a, yeah. I mean, so you could uh, you could at least you could see you could see the algebra as an entailment relation over operations, which are seen as free algebras on you know finite finite terms. Okay. Uh, so now, yeah. So now I'm just going to be dis trying to uh, describe a certain um, you know some some mathematical structure and. You know, of course, feel free to uh, ask questions, ask for clarifications, interrupt, and shout, whatever. Okay, so let me erase this. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to make this uh, basic definition. Okay, so how do we talk about type refinement? What is type refinement? So I'm going to say, you know, assume we start with some category C of types. You know, a refinement structure on C is just a functor from C op to cat. Okay. So of course this is a very you know basic thing uh, that people consider sometimes called an index category. Uh, why you know okay so so I want to begin by explaining why I'm calling this refinement structure. Or wh what what's the connection to this idea of of Type refinement. So, okay. So, so here's the idea. So, this category C is going to be considered as a category of, of types. Um, I, you know, I'll use the letters A, B for uh, the objects of C, or sometimes you know, gamma, delta, and the maps. In C, uh, I will sometimes call values uh, because you know, I get these are the basic stuff that we we build things out of maps of the category C. Now, uh, the category for any one of these types, the category A star is the 
call it the local category of refinements of A. OK. All right, so now a notation from, you know, which comes from the refinement typing literature. Um, if you have an object S of A star, I'll write, I'll write this, the fact that S is an object of this, I'll write it as S refines A, so with this square uh, containment relation. So S is a sort of predicate over A. It's, it's identifying some, intuitively, some subset of, of A with some property. So, you know, before when I was talking, when I was explaining this concept intuitively and the way that it appears in the refinement typing literature, you might write something like the evens are a refinement of the natural. Uh, now, OK, so these are the objects of the local category of refinements. There's also you know, a category. There's, there's a, um, there are maps between refinements of a type. And that's going, you know, that corresponds to subtyping. So I'll write, you know, if you have S arrow T, in A star, I'll write that as S is a subtype of T at A, or maybe A can be explicit, you know, in, 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 implicit. So, so arrows of the local category of refinements of A correspond to subtyping judgments. Um, and then we can also define equality at A, which just says that this map is invertible. Okay, so now I'm, um, of course, you know, I'm talking about the local category of refinements. Yes? A star is a category. Excuse me? Right. I mean, you, you don't have, well, yes, there's no condition that they should be equal, and it's not um, anti-reflexive. So you can have S subtype of T and T as subtype of S, but this does not, in general, imply that S is equal to T. Yeah. Uh, Excuse me? In the case of S when it is, uh, for example, you know, there is an approach for first subtyping for each subtyping yeah. doesn't exist for S. It's some uh, version and it's mapped from subtyping to the supertype. Yeah. And uh, there, at least, uh, when you call it conditional coherence of the subtyping, I mean, the quality of both version maps yeah. is the same subtype and supertype. Yeah. Uh, right, so, so I mean, this gets back to this original uh, problem <laughs> that there's, there's kind of two different views of types and there's also two different views of subtyping. And one is this coercion interpretation and another is this value inclusion interpretation that, you know, if, uh, you know, typically, and what I'm, you know, you, you have a rule like if, if E is, is a, uh, a type tau and tau is a subtype of sigma, then E is, uh, type sigma, and it's the same E, and you you want to kind of interpret that there's no computational coercion, but um, this is a value inclusion approach, um, and I will I will get to I will explain that uh, I'll explain that now. So okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. 
No, 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 no. It, it, it means that there's an isomorphism. It, right. me, it means that this is invertible, this map, l let me write it down. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So I, I want to now discuss the thing which relates to this question about coercions, um, and that's that. Okay. In addition to these local categories of refinements, there is a, a global category of refinements, and that you know corresponds to just the usual growth and deconstruction. So associated to such a refinement structure, or such an index category, there is a corresponding category of elements. Uh, and maybe I'll recall the, the usual construction. So if you have such a, if you have a functor like this, you can define a category Category of elements of F whose objects are pairs of objects of C. Uh, do I have that? Yeah. And objects of F of A. And the maps from A, S to B, T correspond to maps, a map from A to B in the underlying category together with a map from S map from S to F of F of T. And because you know this is an object in the category FA, and T is an object in the category FB, but when you apply this base change functor, functor it becomes an object of FA. So you can ask for a map. Um, and you can compose these sort of things. So now um, the point is that you can represent these, uh, these kinds of, of arrows very nicely as, as typing judgments. So, and, and, and this is, you know, yeah, okay, so let me describe. Wow, you can use both. Okay. So, suppose we have a value, gamma arrow A. Uh, you know, so this is just a value, it's some, some object that we've constructed. Now we want to make some refinement typing judgment about that. So what does that mean? And, and now, you know, the, in the usual uh, approach in refinement typing, that means that first we have a refinement of the context. So I'm going to write that as psi refines gamma. And then we have a refinement of the type A. Uh, so I'll write that as S refines A. And then we can make the judgment, we can ask the judgment, which I'll write like this. Uh, I'll use the double, I'll use the you know, satisfaction relation to, to remind you that th we're talking about something which maybe is different from the way that you usually think of these things. And I'll say that V, now we ask that in context C, V has the refinement S. This is a sort of proposition about, about V. Um, but so now what is this thing? How do you interpret this thing? Well, this is just a map in the, in the Grothendieck deconstruction. So this is just a map from C to V star S.
And now, uh, to get back to this point about subtyping, so uh, you know, the, local, the, the global category of refinements subsumes the local categories in the sense, yes? No, no, please go ahead. Well, um, so, I mean, okay, so traditionally, so th th let, me, let me put some context. Traditionally, the idea of refinement typing was that it was some sort of intermediary between simple types and refinement typing. So you start with a language like, like ML, which is simply typed, maybe with polymorphism, and you don't change the computational content, but now you want to verify additional properties. So, so you define this layer of refinement typing on top of some sort of simple, simply typed or polymorphic typed. But uh, like my, my point is kind of that I think that in, de in traditional dependent type theory, these ideas are, are a bit mixed up. And so I'm trying to start from the point of view of refinement typing and work, work my way up so that we, you know, can start, we can account for dependent type theory and things like substructural logic. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let me uh, let me make this point that the um, the global category of refinements subsumes the local categories in the sense that you know this subtyping judgment this is you know so S is a subtype of T at at A this is equivalent to asking that in context S the identity at A has refinement T. So subtyping has this identity coercion interpretation, which, which is something that appears in the refinement typing literature. Um, okay, now um, let me just describe you know, some of the uh, you know, so composition in the in this you know the Grodin deconstruction can be presented like so. So if you have um, let me see if I have this right. Okay. So I mean, so, so this is a rule for composing in the, in the category of you know, the Grotendieck construction, but we can see it as a rule for composing refinement typing judgments. So if V has refinement S in context Xi and C has refinement T in context S, then by applying C to V, we have something, an object which has refinement T and context psi. And, and just now to, to maybe to make this clear, let me write, you know, what is the refinement structure here. So again, this is some refinement of a context. Do I have it right? No. <laughs> this is, well, this is refining some context gamma or some object of C, some, some type gamma. This is refining some A and V is is an object of underlying type gamma a, and you know here we again we have a, uh, b, and c as being some. Uh, and here, you know, yeah. So gamma b and. Um, and right, so now this rule of composition sp 
specializes to some rules of uh, subsumption and, and conversion if we take this interpretation of subtyping. So let me explain that. So if you have that V is of refinement S and you have a subtyping, you know, you have that S is a subtype of T, then you, ha you can show that V has refinement T. And this just, you know, this is uh, just an instance of this general rule, right? Because we're taking the subtyping judgment as corresponding to a map that is the identity. And so when you compose with the, when you compose the V with the identity, you just get V. Um, and, right, and you have the same thing with, you know, you can apply this with an equality Okay. So yes. Right. Um chi is below chi prime. Yes. Yeah. And then chi right. Okay, so, so now I, uh, like, you know, starting from, from this, I want to um, describe some constructions, some logical constructions that you, c that you can do here. Um, so, uh, and kind of, you know, this is something which is, of course, very familiar, just an indexed category, but uh, I want to describe them in this notation of, of type refinement. So, Okay, so, so let's start with just you know, what we have here, which we have this functor, and we can see this functor as a constructor of refinement types. So let, let me show that. So you know, if we have, you know, so these are, this is gonna be a formation rule, type formation rule, or a refinement formation rule. If we have that S refines A, then, and F is an operation from A to B, and I guess, well, I should be consistent and I'll write this as V. Then V star of S refines, oh, I got this backwards, sorry. V star of S refines A. Uh, so, you know, we, this is, Call this an inverse image refinement. Um, because intuitively it corresponds to taking an inverse image. If you have some property of the type B, then you have a map taking some other type into B, you can try to but you know, extract the uh, subset of A satisfying that predicate. Um, and then, so this is the object part of this functor, the functoriality. <coughs> we can see it as a subtyping rule that says if S is a subtype of T, you know, of course this is implicit, well, say this is implicit in A, then F star of S is a subtype of B, is a subtype of F star of T at B. Um, okay. Uh, now, okay, so, so now what's the next uh, construction that we can consider? 
the idea is no, now we can start asking for more, more structure on this, uh, you know, associated to this functor in order to model more operations of logic. So the most basic one uh, we're going to ask for is that these functors, v star, th these functors, yeah. so each individual functor v star has a left adjoint. So let me write that. Okay. So Uh, you know, okay, so a, a refinement structure is total if each V star as a left adjoint. And uh, we can express this in type theoretic language uh, like so. So first give a type formation rule. So if, now the rule I wanted to write before, if S refines A and V is an operation from A to B, then I'll write it as Vs refines B. And the adjunction is expressed as an equivalence between subtyping and typing. Because you know this right, you can see as a, a map v star t, and that's what the left adjoint property is, is saying. Um, okay, so uh, let me now give uh, just uh, give you a few examples. So of these, you know, such structures. So. Okay, some examples. Okay, the first example of a refinement structure is just the you know, trivial one. So if you have some category uh, D, then you can build a refinement structure on the one point category. You know, take, the, take C to be just the one point category and you can define the star operation. Well, I'm just asking for a little clarification. You said that there is a C is our category strike, but now I understand that D is your category strike. No, no, no. Then some category of refinement of that. Okay, um, but so okay now, sort of okay. A more interesting example and sort of the canonical example is uh, taking pre sheaves. The, oper the operation of taking pre sheaves. So we'll take as C to be cat, and you know module. If we uh, ignore size issues, we can do this, and then. Uh, the oper you know, this uh, structure is going to be the operation of taking pre-sheaves. And I'll, these will be covariant pre-sheaves. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, 
So you send a category A to the category of pre-sheaves over A, and the functorality is just by pre-composition. So if you have F, then you send it to the, uh, okay, so to pre-composition with F. Um, okay, so now uh, the, both of these are total in this sense. I mean, the first one, of course, is trivially total. Um, the second one, uh, the idea is if you have, um, so if you have, suppose you have S refining A, which now is interpreted as S is a pre sheaf over A, and now you have an operation A or B, um, which is now functor, and then f of s is now going to be a functor, a pre sheaf over b, which is defined by this um, Cohen formula. So uh, this is a Cohen. Let me write this in. So uh, if you haven't seen ends and coens before, I mean, this is a bad notation from category theory, but you can read this as a, just as an existential quantifier. Um, okay, uh, so, um, okay, now the next point is that, uh, so, okay, I'm gonna call these refinements, uh, weighted refinements. So the, the V, the value V is a sort of weight on the uh, refinement S. And you can see these as in some sense a generalization of a singleton types, so-called singleton types. Um, so you know, in, in particular, if you have a closed value, one arrow A, then you can consider it as a refinement of A by applying it to the trivial refinement of, of one. Um, but this idea, um, okay, so, so this idea actually lets you uh, define now a new notion of ordering on um, on values on maps of the underlying category C uh, corresponding to in a sense corresponding to natural transformation so let me let me write that so Uh, if we have two values of the same type, we can define a natural transformation from U to V as just a family of maps U C to V C natural and C refining gamma. Um, and the idea is that if you have such a definition, this justifies now a conversion rule on values. So if U has refinement S and 
there's a natural transformation from u to v, then v has a finite s. And you can you know, derive this by the fact that, OK, this thing is equivalent to, um, oh, I got it backwards. Sorry, I wasn't looking at the notes. OK, so <laughs> this ends up being backwards. Uh, so this thing is equivalent to, is defined as, we have, we have such a subtyping judgment. And this thing uh, is equivalent to u psi is subtype of s. And then by combining these with the the transitivity of subtyping, we obtain that VXC is a subtype of S, and therefore that this conclusion. Okay. Um, so uh, may maybe maybe I'm. H how are people? <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's a good one. Yeah. I I am not I'm not sure about that. I mean, I mean, so the idea is, is kind of similar to, to what you were talking about. I mean, the idea is that the underlying base category, C, is constructing values. So it's constructing stuff. And then the um, computation goes on the second level. So for example, you, know, you can consider logic programming. You can, you can imagine, well, and you, you can do it, you can define an operational semantics as one of these, you know, as, as such a, a functor in the sense that uh, your underlying terms, uh, you know, you define a category which uh, lets you build the underlying syntactic terms. Then you can define an operational semantics as a, you know, generalized relation over such terms. Um, I have an example. I don't know if I probably won't get to that, and it's probably not worth talking about it here. But I can talk, show you it later. So I think maybe uh, it's worth showing a easy example to actually give this as a new defining function. So if you say power set function, for example, yeah, so right, and then psi is yeah. the power set function. Yeah. So every time you have all possible properties, so a star. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, I mean, because we, we don't need to talk about the morphism so far, but, but, um, the question is, are they there? What were their yeah. Results? yeah, 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 they're, they're, they're there. So they're there. you measure the equal to V, maybe, so given family of morphism, V psi is the same family as V psi. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, now, um, the next part is that uh, we want to introduce some ideas from monoidal categories. Um, 
so because okay, part of the thing is we we want to we want to build up you know, the base category is some category of operations and operations have arities. We want to take multiple arguments. So, um, so you know, how do you introduce a monoidal structure? Um, yes. No, I mean, event, okay, so I mean, the idea is that we're going to, I, I think that you need them because then you're going to talk about monoidal closed, a monoidal closed structure, and that's important for talking about computation. Oh, like why yeah. monoidal as opposed to Cartesian? Yeah, um, Well, one is that you can do it. Like you, you can make it monoidal. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't have very good examples yet. But yeah. um, okay, so yeah, a Suppose that C is monoidal, then uh, you know this structure is monoidal if this functor is uh, lax monoidal. So um, this can be expressed in uh, you know, in type theoretic notation, is saying, well, we have a formation rule that says if S is a refinement of A and T is a refinement of B, then so now I'm, I'm going to use uh, pairing notation for the monoidal product. So I'll say that S comma T is a refinement of A comma B, and. And then there's a rule of subtyping which says that if S1 is a subtype of S2 and T1 is a subtype of T2, then S1, T1 is a subtype of S2, T2. Um, and let, let me give let me give an, the example. So in this category of, in, in this, the, the pre-sheaf uh, refinement structure, if we have S a pre-sheaf over A and T a pre-sheaf over B, we can define the product as a pre-sheaf over A cross B, which is just Defined as you know the, the pointwise multiplication, and yes, yeah. um, okay. So, so this yeah, I mean this, this kind of structure has also been studied by Michael. You know, there's a paper on uh, monoidal fibrations. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, once you have, let's see. Um, so, okay, l l let me give a, a, another example now of some, so once you have this kind of structure, you have you have these left adjoints and you have uh, the monoidal structure, you can do things, define things like uh, the, the day tensor product, right? So, um, you know, the day tensor product is this 
general construction um, you know, if you have a mon monoidal category C and then the category of free sheaves over C is also has a monoidal structure and the idea is it's defined by this uh, convolution. So um, S, right, S tensor T of C is this This is the day tensor product. And you can express this um, in a, you know, more general terms in, in this sort of structure as uh, the following uh, formation and introduction rules. So if we have, you know, so now assume we're, we're working in this monoidal refinement structure. So our base category is monoidal. And we have, and now assume that we have a monoid in this in this base category. So we have a type which is a monoid in the sense that we have some operation that I'll write tensor, um, a binary operation, and a unary operation, which I'll write like this, and they satisfy some equations. And now um, we can derive if you have that S is a refinement of A and T is a refinement of A, the same A, then tensor of ST is a refinement of A. So you know, we, we derive this by just applying the formation rules. And, and then we can also derive the, you know, a a rule like the um, the formula for the for the day tensor product. So let's see if I have this. So, um, okay. So, so now, okay. I, I hope that I've convinced you that there's something here. So now, the next, um, oh, yeah. yeah. What would that mean for you for the type form? Would that be like in the type form? R um, if it weren't. So like, if it were actually a product. Yeah. What do you mean by intersection type? Like saying that the A value has a Oh, right, right, right. Um, right, I mean, so like idempotent, idempotent intersection types. Like, I mean, yes, the usual interpretation of intersection types is you, you can consider that way. There's also a, like people actually study non-idempotent intersection types where this is not a Cartesian. Yep. So like, if it's Cartesian, then it's Cartesian, but if it's Fourier, um, then the thing with the values is the last cross, which would be the, the type, right? Mm. So you would back to the T for this, but like not 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he has so some. I, I, I'm oh. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I misunderstood what he was trying to do. I, I was thinking that he was going to get the substructure stuff out of this function, but he was saying something else. Now he's saying, I can do refinements, refinement type for substructures like this. Um. Okay. So so. One of the things is that there's sort of a, um, there's an analogy of uh, types to refinements as uh, context categories to, um, to formulas. So, um, okay, but what does this have to do with my question, which is, yeah. if you want to have some structural right. types, right. you're going to get them by putting a, a substructure on C. Putting, so C is a monoidal category. Yeah. It, has, it has some, you can express different algebraic operations yeah. in that monoidal category. For example, you can express that the fact that you have a monoid in in the in that category. So, for example, you know, now we take A to be the, a category of of contexts in, in linear logic, right? So, um, you know, so now our um, Right. It could, it, that's an that's an interpretation. Yeah. Um, and I mean, so are you referring to this category C? Yeah. You're right, yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Um. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's in, in this example as well. You know, we take the monoidal structures, in fact, Cartesian. Um. Right. So, um, okay. So the the sort of the there's two more things, and I don't know if I really have time, but uh, but let me I'll try to do it. So the idea, the next step is to consider uh, consider. Monoidal closed structure, so closures for this monoidal product. Um, right. So, so here we saw, you know, we wanted a monoidal structure on the refinements, so we asked for a monoidal structure on types. Uh, we're going to do the same step. So, we're going to get a monoidal structure on refinements, by a monoidal closed structure on refinements by asking for a closed monoidal closed structure on types. And um, 
so let me just remind you of you know what monoidal closed means. So um, you know, so when we're working in a not necessarily symmetric context, a, a category C uh, is monoidal closed if there is a bijective correspondence between maps from ST, uh, sorry, anticipating, from A, B, so from the, the product of A and B to C, and now from A to the right implication, and from B to the left implication. And I'm just, I'm going to label these. So if F is a map from A times B to C, um, I'll call this a row of F for right and lambda F. So now, um, the idea is that if we start with such a monoidal closed structure, um, we can, we, we want to lift it to the global category of refinements, okay? So, so if you uh, write out what, you know, if you work out what that means, it means that you have the following formation rules. So if S is a refinement of A and T is a refinement of B, uh, sorry, uh, S is a refinement of A and U is a refinement of C, then um, the left implication from S to U is a refinement of the left implication from A to C. And you know, similarly, if U is a refinement of C and T is a refinement of B, then the right implication from T to U is a refinement of the right, oh, I switched these, right implication from B to C. Uh, so that's the formation rules. And then um, what, you know, th this sort of correspondence, when you lift it to the global category of refinements, uh, says that if you have a map from ST to U in the category of refinement, the global category of refinements, so you know, that corresponds, that comes with an associated map F from AB to C. This holds if and only if you have a map from T to Um, so this thing m might seem strange at first, but this is, this is actually a very you know, simple standard construction. Let me show it in, in this case. Um, so push it up, <laughs> good idea. Okay, so if you have S, uh, uh, pre-shift over A and 
u appreciative over c, then you can form appreciative s left implies u over um, over a left implies c, but in this case, uh, this just collapses to the, you know, the functor category a c. So this thing is now defined as you know a sense some any uh, functor from A to C to now this is going to be computed as an end so which again is just bad notation for a universal quantifier but uh, so an end over A of from, you know, maps from S of A to U of F of A um, and I mean, this is a sort of standard construction that appears in, like, for example, the literature on refinement typing. You want to say, if you have a function, um, what is it? I, I mean, the idea is that this type corresponds to uh, functions over the underlying, uh, you know, this is a function from A to C over the, the underlying stuff, which, if it's given, an object satisfying S sends it to an object satisfying U. Um, okay. So. Um, okay. So so. The 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 final okay so. The, so the point was that okay we got we asked for a monoidal structure on the base category in order to get a corresponding monoidal structure. And then a corresponding structure on the um, ref on refinements. And then we asked for a monoidal closed structure on the base in order to define a corresponding monoidal closed structure on refinements. Um, but uh, but somehow. Uh, Question is sort of how do we get started? Okay, so um, maybe this is hard to uh, maybe this is hard for me to to moderate and explain. Um, but kind of the, the question is is when you know we ha we have this uh, these closures on on refinements which are defined abstractly as satisfying this thing. But but the question is there a lower level representation? for uh, for such such um, closures and you know an example that you can have in mind is uh, the for example the Yonetta lemma right so the Yonetta lemma says that when we consider um, maps between uh, pre natural transformations between pre sheaves those can be you know in the case that those pre sheaves are are representable, then then those, you know, that space of maps can be represented by maps in the underlying category. Um, so, you know, this is also tied to kind of an idea which I was thinking about, which which gets back to the question of um, uh, like the computational content. So, there's this old um, paper by John Reynolds called the Def definitional interpreters for higher order programming languages where he talks about you know like how do you understand a, a, a higher order program and it's sort of you know we know from the fact that there are compilers that we, we have a programming language that has sort of arbitrary higher order stuff we can compile it down to some machine well uh, Reynolds uh, you know this paper he discussed how to do that in sort of a systematic way by this um, technique that he called defunctionalization. Uh, so, kind of the the next the next thing that you know that I'm going to be describing is sort of a way of trying to make sense of defunctionalization. Um, so, okay, so 
let me let me try to describe that and um, I think it's worth I think it's worth trying to describe that and then I'll be done so okay so first let me just mention a fact that if you are working in a in a monoidal closed category there is uh, there's two sort of canonical monads you can define you know if 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 c is a monoidal closed category well okay if it's a if it's a cartesian if if it's a cartesian closed category we can define uh, two monads um, you know we can define a family of, of monads so uh, for any, you know, we, we define the monad which sends A to its double negation. This is sometimes called the continuations monad in programming. And then we also have the monad which uh, sends A to S cross A to the S. So, so here both R and S are arbitrary objects. So we have a family of monads. This is sometimes called the, usually called the, the state monad. And the reason for, for that is you, know, you can think of S as some state and um, you interpret your, you reinterpret your, your computation you know, a computation of type A is something which can take an initial state, transform the state in some way, and produce a computation of type A. Um, so in a, okay, this is in a Cartesian closed category, we have these. And in a monoidal category, these just split up into, into two versions. So we have... have this and this and we have this and this okay um, so I'm going to be using this fact so this the state monad, and now, um, okay, so I'm going to define um, an orthogonality. in some refinement, in some uh, closed, monoidal closed refinement structure is going to be a triple of refinements, S refining A, T refining B, and then U refining AB. Now, rather than an arbitrary object, it's going to be refining AB. <coughs> so such that there is a subtyping map from S cross T to U. Um, so let me give you an example. In this refinement structure, uh, any object of a category determines an orthogonality in this sense. So if you have some category A, and then an object X in A. Um, you can define the Yoneda pre-sheaf. You know, this is a this is a pre-sheaf over 
A op. Okay, so it's a refinement of A op. And then there is the dual Yoneda, which is a refinement of A, so the covariant pre sheaf. And then you have, of course, you have just the hum by module, which is a refinement of A op cross A. And now you have, you know, this natural transformation corresponds to, to, to this. So it, it just corresponds to composition through X in the category. Okay, um, so now we can show the following. So um, you know, if you have such a refinement, if you have such an orthogonality, S cross T below U, um, you know, then you can build a subtype thing T below. Now let me let me write this. Okay, so Okay, to a first approximation, you know, you're, I'll write, I'll write this. So if you have a subtyping S cross T below U, then you have subtyping T uh, below S implies U. But, but this is, doesn't type check because this is a refinement of B and this is a refinement of um, A implies, left implies, a B. Um, so what we just what we do is we just take the inverse uh, image refinement, which I'll of we take the inverse image refinement along the unit of the state known as. And we can similarly show that S is we can show this. Um, so now um, so, so this leads now to to another definition, and we'll say that um, you know this orthogonality has. Let me see if I get the directions right. So left uh, polarity, if this map. T is invertible, and similarly, right polarity if this map is invertible. And we'll say it's ambipolar if it's both. Um, okay, so, so this is um, this is where I, I got to um, getting back, okay. I d this might be hard to, to motivate. Um, I can, 
I can show you some examples, and maybe that, and then that's that's it. So this this example is you know, this is an example of an ambipolar orthogonality in the sense, um, and the fact that these that these uh, subtyping maps are invertible just corresponds to the Yoneda lemma. So maybe it's worth showing that and then be done. So, um, right, so, so what is, okay. So this thing, if you if you okay, so this uh, this thing, if you calculate it, you know, if you if you compute this inverse image, is just going to be the pre-sheaf um, contravariant pre-sheaf, which sends uh, a to the end over uh, over c. Of this, so C X C implies now it's going to be I C, and we we get this by precomposing this definition with the unit of the state monad, and so and then all you know we we know that there is such a, you know, for any um, AX, for any object A, we have a map to this end. And in fact, it's invertible by the Yoneda lemma. Um, so, um, should we stop now? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>